So what we're going to talk about tonight, Dr. Burke, is uh, the concept of New Testament Apocrypha in general. So for those in our audience unfamiliar, could you elaborate further on what we mean exactly by the term New Testament Apocrypha? Um, these are essentially texts that are uh, like what we find in New Testament, so that they focus on first century figures like Jesus and uh, his pals, the apostles and his family. And uh, they are additional stories that are not found in the New Testament. Um, but they, some of them are written before uh, what we call the canon of the New Testament was settled. So they were around um, in the first few centuries. So some of them were, were can possible candidates to be included in the New Testament. Um, but then these also get composed after that as well. We have Apocrypha uh, composed throughout Christian history. So it's, it's, it's sometimes thought that uh, people stopped writing Apocrypha once the canon was settled, which is around the, the, the fourth century or so. Um, and then they just kind of get lost to history. Um, but it's not true at all. Um, people continue to copy them. People continue to write them, um, play around with them, expand them and so on, combine them together in various ways. It just seems that uh, um, Christians really like uh, thinking with first century characters, you know, what, what better way to get uh, new ideas across to a Christian audience than to have, say, Jesus say them or Paul or some other character. Um, so, as I said, they're, they're like the New Testament. So, um, New Testament, in a nutshell, it's got, you know, Gospels that are biographies of Jesus, uh, a book of Acts, which talks about uh, the various apostles and their activities after the death of Jesus. Um, letters, most many of them by Paul, and then a, an apocalypse at the end, the book, book of Revelation. In apocryphal literature, we have texts in all of those genres, right? So we have additional gospels, additional acts, letters, apocalypses, etc. And we'll, we'll talk about various, we can talk about uh, some examples of some of these. Um, but, you know, the New Testament has 27 texts uh, in the apocryphal literature. There's probably somewhere close to 300. So, there's certainly lots of this kind of literature out there um, and has, has something um, special to offer us that, that's worth studying. There seems to be this misconception when people hear the term apocrypha. Uh, kind of gives it a mysterious kind of bent. Um, so what are the problems that arise when we uh, mislabel these terms, uh, these texts as things like apocryphal or non-canonical, what kind of judgments are we making when we use these terms? The word apocryphal, ap apocrypha, is the plural. Apocryphon would be the singular. Uh, it just means hidden or secret or maybe esoteric, you know, like mystical. Um, and we have some texts among the apocrypha that actually use that in their title. So we have an apocryphon of John or apocryphon of James, so that, which just say, simply means secret book of. These texts were composed with some special teachings that go beyond the what everybody else is reading, what the riffraff are reading, right? I think there's nothing wrong with the term apocrypha, but uh, certain people within what became mainstream Christianity um, did not like these texts. You know, they were the texts that they decided they did not want in their canon. And so they would they they started to use the term apocrypha as a pejorative term. Because it just imagine um, these early church writers, we're talking about the second, third century, they're trying to create a kind of a universal uh, faith, that something that everyone can kind of, kind of agree on. And when you do something which is universal or Catholic, it would be the term being used here, um, it tends to get simplified. It's something that everyone can kind of uh, um, understand. So they don't like the idea of these groups that meet uh, kind of uh, extracurricularly, if I pronounce that right, so, you know, outside the church in their own special groups and have their own special meetings where they talk about secret things and hidden things and analogies and spiritual stuff. So they would label their texts as apocrypha in a pejorative way because these are the secret meetings, the secret groups. Um, and that's how the text, the, the, the term has, has taken on uh, that's how the text, sorry, that's how the term is used today. When we talk about something that's apocryphal, we mean something that we're not quite sure is true. And that's another sense that we, that because of the pejorative nature of the term, uh, it tends to get, can, um, become synonymous with fake or forgery. Um, and so you get, end up with this sense that 
what is canonical, what's in the Bible, is true, genuine, and what's not is fake, uh, forgery, uh, apocryphal. Um, and uh, just before I, I, I get too far into it, so you, you use the term non-canonical, and this is a this is a term that scholars use, which is uh, which tries to take away that pejorative sense. So uh, it's less less value laden. We talk about what's in the canon, what's not in the canon, rather than scripture and apocrypha. So non-canonical and canonical. Um, um, another thing about this is that, that dichotomy I was saying about what's in the canon is is true, what's not in the canon is false. But we have texts within the the canon which are in some ways false as well. For example, um, seven of the 13 letters of Paul in the New Testament are believed almost universally uh, by scholars to be genuine. And this is something I, I enjoy pointing out to my class that we actually do agree that these things are genuine. Virtually everything else in the Bible we think is probably not really written by the people whose names are on them. So the other six then of the 13 Pauline letters are written in Paul's name. So there's a certain falseness to that as well. Um, and even the other letters in the New Testament, letters by Peter, letters by John, like James and Jude, we don't think the actual people whose names are on them are actually the writers. So that dichotomy of, you know, in the canon, true, and outside of the canon, false, does not really work. Um, um, but, you know, this is not how we like to talk about this text anyway. We're not, we're not really interested in whether they are really written necessarily by the people whose names are on them. It's more interested in how they function. Um, why were they written? What ideas are they trying to get across? Uh, who were they written for, et cetera? That's, these are the kinds of questions that uh, tend to be more important. I really like um, what you said in your uh, book, Secret Scriptures Revealed, you uh, said, quote, each text has its own story and its own contribution to make to our understanding of Christian history, right? So when we tend to look at these text in value laden terms in terms of okay this is fake and forgery versus uh this is real because it's in a canonical text uh which is our new testament we we tend to lose that richness and to understand that these are real communities and real writers responding to real things in their um environment right it brings me to another question that i have um apocrypha strictly is it related to just literature and the written word? Um, you know, it, it's, it can be ubiquitous in literature and drama um, and art as well, correct? Yeah, and that's, um, that's one of the areas that, that people in the field, uh, like me, are, are uh, really interested in, like the things that are beyond literature, but we tend not to have uh, the skills required that we would like to, uh, to work on it. So we're, we're always anxious to or eager to uh, talk to people who, who are art historians or, or, or drama historians or whatever. Uh, but we can, you know, talk about some examples. Um, uh, text uh, influence other aspects of life. Um, we have lots of examples of uh, artifacts, material artifacts, um, again, throughout the centuries that connect to, to apocryphal texts. Uh, some of the earliest, for example, um, are um, um, things like uh, things involved uh, in pilgrimage for, are a good example. So you would go to a particular holy site, mm -hmm. say um, a, the, um, a church where Mary is said to have sat down on her way from um, um, Jerusalem to Bethlehem for the birth of Jesus. There was a church that was constructed there. And there's a story about this, which is, it's connected to a text called the Infancy Gospel of James. And so there's that church there and people would go to that church and um, I know they're all no longer exist. So we can't exactly say exactly what happened there, but we can imagine. And they would, uh, they would, you know, enjoy the presence of being in the presence of this church. And they may be able to pick up some pilgrim souvenirs and the souvenirs would include, um, uh, images related to what was there, right? And so you, I can imagine it could be uh, some uh, scene from the Infancy Gospel of James, where, um, for example, uh, the way that the Annunciation, where the angel Gabriel talk, uh, talk, announces to Mary that she's going to give birth, um, the Infancy Gospel of James version includes this element where um, Mary is is spinning um, uh, yarn to to help create the temple veil. Uh, the curtain in the temple. And that's only in the Gospel of James, but we have lots and lots and lots of images in antiquity 
um, pilgrim souvenirs, um, um, various ivories, you know, decorative things with that particular image. Um, and one of the interesting things about that is it shows you how um, something from an apocryphal text can influence uh, the, the, what becomes the typical way to show that scene, even though it's not in the canon. But most people, I think, throughout medieval period wouldn't really know the difference um, between what's in and what's out. They just, because most people are illiterate, um, they don't have a clear sense of, of what, what text is what text, but they know images, so they can see that image. So there's lots of uh, things like that, but also um, church decoration. So even, say, that church I was just talking about there um, would have been decorated with images of, of Mary's uh, uh, a journey from Bethlehem to, sorry, from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, as it's told in Infant's Gospel of James. We have lots of images, again, connected with the same text of the, the nativity scene. And, in, and these, uh, again, throughout the centuries, uh, even still today, are very common in the, in the Greek world where Infant's Gospel of James was very popular. But in the nativity scene there, it includes um, a character called Salome, who was a midwife. Um, and she's only talked about in apocryphal texts. Um, so is that church decoration? This is a, a church dedicated to John the Evangelist on Patmos, um, which many people know as the location where the book of Revelation is said to have been written. Uh, uh, um, so John of Patmos is, writes the book of Revelation and tradition tends to associate him with the apostle John. Um, well, you go to this church on Patmos today and it's fully decorated with scenes from a text called the Acts of John by Prochorus, which talks about John's various activities. Um, it's very, very long uh, in both Ephesus, in, which is in Turkey, and Patmos. Not canonical, yet this church, modern church, it's, you know, the, certainly the paintings are older, but it's still standing today, fully decorated with images from um, an apocryphal text. And uh, drama, you're talking about plays. There, there were these, um, what we call mystery plays that were performed uh, throughout the medieval period uh, by trade guilds. So, you know, various people would get together and put on a play for the, for the people of the village. And uh, they would t uh, tell basically the creation of the world or the history of the world from creation to the last judgment. And of course would draw on canonical stories, but also non-canonical stories, um, including um, the story of when Jesus in between his death and his resurrection, where he goes down to hell and liberates all of the, the older saints. So, you know, from Adam and Enoch and David, all these people who, who are uh, heroes of Hebrew Bible and Old Testament stories, but they never got to meet Jesus. So how did they get saved? Well, Jesus has to go down to hell and introduce himself and uh, bring them up into uh, uh, heaven, essentially. That's right. not in the Bible. Uh, but it is in a text called the Gospel of Nicodemus. And so, again, they're drawing on these stories that become very, very popular, very well known. But people don't realize that they're not biblical um, because there's that, you know, that boundary between the two things is 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 porous and not exactly clear throughout the, the centuries. Fascinating. Um, they're they're really playing with the dynamic of the world around them. And they're kind of internalizing it. They're creating something new. So I just find that very fascinating. Um, it's kind of like comic books today, right? Like um, you have a character that was created by these essentially blue collar guys, right? Just going to work, doing a job. I got to come up with a story today. Uh, people read it. They internalize it. They enjoy it. And they um, create their own stories through that, whether becoming a comic book you know, uh, writer, artists themselves, or, you know, and in internalizing the stories that they see on TV, because comics aren't just like the medium comics themselves, right? They're like the um, cartoons, they're the, the, the books you see at the store, you know, all the toys and everything, and people just kind of internalize all this. And some of it becomes, you know, um, for lack of a better term, canonical for them. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's kind of like a... Um, first century version of fan fiction almost. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, that is becoming a, a, an area that people talk about Apocrypha in. Um, mm. the, the, the way I always have a bit of a problem with it, and I, I've become a bit known for being a bit of a curmudgeon on this. Um, and as a, as a fan of, of, of uh, comic books and science fiction and so on, I'm open to this idea. But w w what I don't like about it is, is it creates something which is a, uh, it separates something which is official, like canon, canonical text, versus something that's not official 
and is in some way not as good, right? It's fan fiction, it's it's unprofessional, etc. And I just don't like the the, the kind of a qualitative divide between canonical text and non-canonical text. Um, especially no, that's since, a good point. Yeah, especially since it's the non-canonical texts are not in all instances uh, playing in the world of the canonical texts. Uh, sometimes they've developed alongside uh, early ones anyway. Um, I do like this idea of the, of, the, of, the, of the multiple iterations. So you can have various uh, acts of John, for example, or acts of Paul. Um, you, can, you, can, um, you can have your, your, your regular um, established uh, world, and then you can have your parallel worlds, your multiverses. Uh, and they can all right. operate uh, together. People can read between them and, and, and enjoy their particular worlds in different ways. Certainly there'd be efforts to try and um, make some cohesion out of, uh, of, of these worlds. And this is what we get in comics too, right? Every, I don't know, six years or so, there's some kind of crisis in which they try to bring them all back together again. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so some of these, certainly some of these uh, um, analogies kind of work well for, for thinking how, how to um, uh, how to how these texts were created and how they might interact with one another and how people readers might might uh, kind of take in what's what's in the texts. Um, but as long as you're not saying and one is necessarily better than the other in some way, that that that's uh, that's the part that that, that uh, I bristle at, I guess. Oh no, absolutely agree with you on that that. Um, part. Um, I use fan fiction because it's it's a term, it's kind of like Gnosticism. I don't like the term Gnosticism, but I have to use it, right? So it's kind of like um, some people certainly use fan fiction in a pejorative sense when they talk about that. But yeah. for me, it's, it's it's just, there's no other term I think that besides Dr. Lit was dynamic cultural interaction that really um, captures what's going on there. I think people are, like I said, they're internalizing it. They're, they're have, they have a connection to it, and they make it a part of them, and then they in turn give that back to the culture. So, uh, too, um, just going back to this issue of what of what's in and versus what's out. Um, some people talk about this, the uh, sorry, the uh, Gospel of John as almost like the first apocryphal gospel, and so we can think of it in this term as the first kind of fan fiction. If we think that the Synoptic Gospels were earlier, and generally most people do. John comes along and says, you know, I, I, I'm working, I, the characters I'm okay with, but I'm, I'm going to throw most of that out and create something new. Um, so working within the world, right, of those texts, we're using the characters, using some of the concepts, but something that's very different. And if the Gospel of John was not in the canon, was not selected for it, and we just kind of looked at this separately from it, we'd say, this is nothing like what we, the Jesus we have in the New Testament. This is something quite different. Um, but it is in, so it's canonical. But it's but that difference between the synoptics and John may, um, has led to that a kind of idea of this is almost like an apocryphal text or a fan fiction text because it, it's it's uh, it's it's really taking these ideas and and moving them in a completely different direction. Gospel of John really is like um, you can kind of look at Gospel of John as almost like the the first reboot of yeah. <laughs> the gospel story. Like you have a, a set. Uh, typology of what the story is and then john is like i don't know maybe i'll do my own little spin on that and it's almost like uh if m night Shyamalan decided to remake citizen kane or something you know <laughs> who knows what would come out come out of that or uh i don't know if you read uh kingdom come yes. um dc you know the, the you have those stories and that lore but like when they do that story like you take all the concepts and you turn them on their head and you know it's just another person in that cultural uh, discussion creating their own kind of um, answer to these questions that everybody's dealing with. So, um, yeah, And a new situation, right? That, that's, that's really what Apocrypha is about. Um, something has changed or something is different for one group than a different other group. So they mm -hmm. take the story, they take the characters and, and use them in order to get, get something of their experience out there or get some, uh, have, uh, the author uses these characters to, to try to address a new situation. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, comics will do that for, they've been doing that for about a century. Um, we reinterpret these characters for new situations. And it tends to be, you know, you know, early comics were very black and white in their, their way of looking at good and evil, but we've been in an we're in an increasingly complicated world. And so the, the stories get more complicated. The characters are new, more nuanced. We have, um, 
uh, like we have these these gray characters like the Punisher or Wolverine who who will will will, will kill in uh, whereas Superman would never have done that right so so uh, that's what in a way why you can maybe get a, a Jesus that does something in a fifth century text that the Jesus of the first century would never have done because it's a new new world. It's almost like like uh, what we're doing here with the apocryphal text. Like I, I tend to take the same kind of approach there that I do to comic books. I um, I find value in all these stories, on all these voices, um, and the apocryphal and, and and the canonical texts and all these stories from antiquity. And I do the same thing with comic books. I can read golden age superman like action comics one through seven but i'm not going to mistake that or appreciate it the same way i'm going to appreciate mark millar's red uh red sun or uh all-star superman by grant morrison right it's going to be different different appreciations depending on context and the you know the the different dimensions that they're kind of playing with um brings us back to back around and probably to my um probably one of the most important questions i have uh for you you talk a lot about transmission, recension history, things like this. Uh, why exactly is transmission recension history important? And especially regarding to these texts, and what is the importance of establishing a proper scholarly critical edition? You have this problem in the pseudepigrapha, right? You have something like Joseph and Aseneth or uh, Testament of Solomon, right? Where you have so many different manuscripts and recensions and not everything agrees, right? And what we read in uh, Charles Worth isn't necessarily what's in the manuscripts, right? It's like we put all this together to make it make sense, you know? So it's it's kind of the same in apocryphal literature, right? So I don't know if you could just go into that briefly and the importance well, of it for studying these yeah. things. This is something which is uh, what people in my field um, do all the time. You, you can have people who work in the New Testament who never look at a manuscript uh, because they have the, um, the nice critical edition that they can use and then that's translated into uh, English or whatever language they're working in. With apocryphal texts, uh, they tend to change quite a lot over time. Um, New Testament manuscript, New Testament texts do as well to a certain extent. We have variations in the manuscripts, and there are certainly people who work in work with New Testament texts and manuscript form to try and determine what the right readings are and so on. Um, but uh, the types of changes that we find in, in most New Testament manuscripts are rather small. Apocryphal texts, because they, they never became uh, considered scripture, never really had the kind of an institutional um, control that you find with, with, the canonical, with canonical texts. So they can uh, go into, they can take on uh, a, a variety of forms over time. Things get added to them or taken away from them or texts get combined together. Uh, they just change a lot. Um, so what you want to do, you have, well, you kind of have to figure out, figure out what you want to do with the material. And the, the tendency used to be that you what you want to do is find the original text. So early Apocrypha scholars would go to various monasteries in the East, um, so Western scholars into the East, and find manuscripts and bring them back and then uh, compare them, try to figure out what the original readings were. Uh, and then you'd find some copies in archaeological sites which are closer to the uh, when they would have been composed. And, you know, then they'd, they'd come up with, with some, they'd construct a critical edition, they'd come up with some theories. What did this text mean to its original readers uh, and its original author? But the, the manuscripts can only take you so far back. So um, those earlier efforts to create critical editions, most of the manuscripts were relatively recent. So 15th century, 16th century. But as you get, you find more manuscripts and earlier manuscripts, you, we find that the text is quite different. And so, it's you have to be really cautious about what you want to achieve. Can you actually say a 15th century manuscript reflects its the the original text, which was composed, say, in the second century? Uh, probably not. What about you find one from the 10th century? Well, better, but is that still the 10th, second century? Probably not. So um, it's always this this problem where you could come up with this great theory about this text based on the critical edition you've created but a new manuscript could be discovered tomorrow an earlier one which is far different from the one you're working on safer in a sense um by trying to figure trying to uh be i guess more realistic about your options if if you have a 10th century manuscript of a particular text 
then what does it tell us about the 10th century context of that text, right? That's a much on a much safer ground. I'm um, not that I, I don't think uh, I don't think you should abandon the idea of trying to get to original text, but I think you have to be really cautious about 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 what you're going to say about it, um, because again, you're, this, the whole apple cart could be upset with it with a new manuscript, and this is uh, the. Um, as I said, this is the work that we all kind of do, and it's one of the most exciting aspects of our work because we get to um, play with these these uh, manuscripts, so, so handwritten texts. Sometimes in person, we can go to the libraries and see them ourselves, but mo many of them today are digitized. We can get to we get to work with them at home on our computers, which is great. But each one of these has its own particular personality and its own quirks, and and uh, it can be a lot of fun to work with. Um, get an apocryphal person more excited than to see a manuscript and, and see the particularities involved with it. Um, but and just in thinking about my own work, um, I, I, my doctoral thesis was on the infancy gospel of Thomas. And when that was, uh, when I was first working on it, it was uh, the, the critical edition of the time was based on 15th and 16th century manuscripts. Mm -hmm. But I knew there was more out there. And I thought, right. well, you, you spend a lot of time just to just to make a point here, like you, I've read that, and you spend a lot of time talking about the the recensions and the the manuscript tradition at the very beginning, very very technical, very detailed. So check mm -hmm. that out if you want to learn more. Um, but Dr. Burke, sorry, please continue. <laughs> okay, um, I, I won't I won't belabor the point too much, but the um, I knew there were other manuscripts out there, and so uh, I thought I better get them all together if I'm going to say anything substantial about this text. And so uh, the the main contribution to that was finding. Uh, this manuscript from the 11th century, which gets us closer to the original. And then I worked later on on Syriac manuscripts, some of which were from the 5th or 6th century, which gets us closer still. And so you try and put all these things together and, and then see see what we can say about the text as a result. Much for that. And this has been um, an absolute pleasure for me. Um, Dr. Burke, did you want to plug anything before we go tonight? The uh, series I edit called uh, New Testament Apocrypha, More Non-Canonical Scriptures. Um, yes. We have a new volume coming out very soon. Apparently, my copies are in the mail. So volume three is out. Um, and all three of them you can take a look at on my website, which is just tonyburke.ca. And you can see the contents and this, uh, the introductions are there as well. So you can read those. Um, I helped create an organization called NASCAL, the North American Society for the Study of Christian Apocryphal Literature. So this is all the apocrypha nerds and their society where we uh, work together and hopefully gather together sometimes to work on things. But our, we have a website called nascal.com. And one of the projects we've, we uh, work on is something called eClavis. And it's, it's a great big uh, bibliographical uh, resource for text. So you can go to, you can look at any one of these, uh, well, there's now 250 entries on it. So, but there's more to come. Um, so pick one of these 250 texts and you'll get a summary. You'll get uh, links to scholarship, links to manuscript images and et cetera. So they're a great little introduction to, to uh, um, to the to the text and it's open access and it's free to free to use and so those are the the two main uh, projects that I think your listeners would be interested in. It's been an honor. Thank you very much uh, for lending your time and your expertise. Um, and you have a great evening. Thank you. <laughs>